It is a pleasure for all of us at CHGO, even though I'm the only one here for this Bears podcast interview, to be talking to a historic figure, the most games ever in a Bear uniform, 245 damn games, Patrick Manley working with Zebra Technologies and his long snapper award, which we'll get to. Uh, but does that still feel weird that you're, I mean, you're Bears royalty, Patrick Manley. It's, it's no, kinda, I'm not. Yeah. Listen, what I tell everybody this, and, and I talked to Mongo, Stephen Michael had the record before, I think at 200, or sorry, 191 games. And I got lucky to beat his record. I think he had maybe 192, whatever it was. And I got lucky to beat his record. And he's like, listen, you're a damn long snapper. How do you, you know, just think about him and his big burly way of talking to me. I said, listen, Mr. McMichael, you played in 192 games. I participated in the ones <laughs> I played in. So, and he looked at me and goes, I appreciate that a lot. That, mean, that means a lot. I go, no, there is a difference. The other thing is, guys, he played in those straight, I think it's 192 straight games at D-Lime. It didn't miss a single game. I was fortunate to play, what, 245? I think I missed 11 games. But to be mentioned with the, you know, the Olin Cruises, Walter Payton, Steve McMichael up there with those guys, the amount of games you're going to play, it, it's, a, it's a dream come true to say that I did that, but I still kind of can't believe it. 2000, I mean, let's be clear. In my mind, at least, and I grew up in that era, Steve McMichael, that dude belongs in the Hall of Fame NFL. Amen. Amen. Uh, so, so, and no one's quite making that argument for you, but it's still an incredible <laughs> accomplishment. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> hey man, 16 I, no. years in the, in the no, NFL. No. It, it, I'm a long it's, snapper. It's okay. I get all it. All right. I got it. 2,282 times though in your career without a botch snap. Where, where does, I actually, when I was reading that, I'm like, where does the perfectionist part of you come from? Like when you trace that back, where do you get to? Um, I've always tried to figure that out. My family did as well. I was the kid that like, I always had the neat room had the little calendar on the desk and had everything written out of when assignments were due, when tests were. I don't know where it came from. I guess maybe more my dad than my mom, but they still can't figure out why I was so like this all the time, even from just being a, a, a little kid. I mean, it says on Wikipedia that you you actually were able to track the amount of rotations on the football in a short snap, I, which I'm trying to understand myself. Like, how do you so you then you know the exact force that you have to have to get that exact is that that's the deal it's exactly what it was now guys in the video capability they have they can literally get that high definition camera on the rotation of the ball and as i got older that became a little more prevalent when hd came in and 4k and all that stuff but back when i started it was more of a feel thing it was just all right this speed feels like this rotation this speed feels like this rotation it was truly a feel thing for me and I wish I had more of the video capabilities that they have now when I was younger, but it is what it is. And I did. I just, I think I snapped so many damn times. I just got just, just used to being able to find out whatever speed I needed to get to, to have Maynard or Podlash, whoever was holding, get the laces out forward. Did you like going to practice or like, oh, I got to do this again? No, I, I loved it. I, I tell kids all the time, if you want to be a long snapper, you got to love, you got to love the perfectionist part. You've got to be hungry about that and understand you can't be perfect all the time. But if you do screw up, don't screw up for your next 10 to 20 snaps. But I did. I loved going out there and trying to perfect my craft. And that's, I think that's what helped me, honestly, play as many games as I did in many, as many years as I did. So I want to kind of spiral through your career here and then talk about your award. But I, I let's, let's just hit some current bear stuff right now. Number one, are you sold on the quarterback? I am. But I'm not as sold as some people are. I think some people say he's already here. It's ready to go. I still think he has a lot of work to do inside the pocket. Uh, what he can do athletically, obviously nobody's done that in, the, in NFL history. He's already breaking records, which is amazing, and I praise that. But I still – I guess I'm kind of selfish or I just – I want the best for him and I want the best for the Bears. I want the best of me as an alumni and a, and a fan. I want him to do it all. I want him to be able to throw from the pocket. I want him to be able to win games in the fourth quarter and then show me a 55-yard run on second five when you're running a zone read. Um, so he's almost there, but I think there's a lot of – improvement that can be there inside the pocket. And I guarantee you that they're preaching that at Hallis Hall and teaching him that, but we're seeing it, but there's still some growth to be, uh, to come, come from him. I heard your first head coach on your radio station, uh, the score talking about uh, fields and hearing that I hear he's pretty sore. Uh, and you know, they got the bye week this week and they got four games to go. Are, are you playing him? If he's not a hundred percent, you 100%. are hundred percent, 100 percent. I'm playing. If he's not a hundred percent, I don't believe in the, the hundred percenters. I think there's too many guys now 
and I'm not saying, oh, we're tough for back in the day or whatever. I'm only a long snapper, so I can't call people out. But as I got older in the league, I saw guys that were coming in on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they're like, man, I'm just, I don't think I can play Saturday or Sunday. But I'm like, but you're practicing and you look like you can, but they're like, no, I need to be 100%. I'm like, no, you don't. It's the NFL. Nobody's 100%. 17 games now is, is impossible to be 100%. Um, if he's not going to hurt himself any worse, if he's not going to put himself in harm's way, you go out there and you play for your team. And I love the fact that he wasn't 100% last week. He said, you know, he did full practice, what, Thursday, Friday? But you know he's not feeling great. But he went out there and, and, and told his teammates, hey, I'm here for you. I'm going to give us the best chance to win. That's the best player on the field right now for the Bears. And I love that he went out there and did it. And, yes, he needs to play. Yeah, it, I mean, right. And you can never ensure that even a guy who is – quote unquote 100 percent is not going to get hurt out there right right he can hurt another body part i don't want to hurt you know knock on wood i guess that's as close as i can get to wood but yeah he can hurt anything else out there he can hurt another i'm not going to go there but yeah so you, you just go out there and play you're paid to play and that, that's his job yeah and i think listen we've seen tons of growth and mm -hmm. we also i think you i i feeling that you blatantly uh agree with this uh, blatant take is what I'm saying. He needs to throw the ball more in the pocket. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yeah. I, yeah. I would I obviously answer, I'd like to see him just some more pocket passes called. And this last week, it seems like there were. There were more five man protections, six man protections, not as many movement passes. And I understand you want to get him on the move, and that's the best way to do it. But I also think there's growth involved with learning to throw from the pocket, learning what a dirty pocket is. I mean, like color coming off of Cody White here's shoulder or you know bent corner with a tackle that he's able to step up and still find the open guy and i would like to see what he had 20 what he had 25 pass attempts last week i think that's right from yeah. there on out it should be that should be the minimum depending on the game really but i think the minimum should be 25 pass attempts or more for him yeah i like it uh do you have optimism about the bears going forward because they've been in so many close games is that a reason to believe that hey they're this close i think it's all about ryan poles in this offseason I mean, this offseason, I was just talking to my dad about it. He was like, I'm so sorry, son, that the Bears are bad. I'm like, you don't understand. They are in a complete rebuild. You know, they, they are I, – I think they're trying to do what the Cubs did and other organizations have done in other sports. Some of these guys, I think a lot of these guys aren't going to be on this team. So I don't really think this year is going to carry over so much to next year. But I think this offseason is all about Ryan Poles and what he can do with hitting with the big price free agents and then hitting with some draft picks. And hitting with some of the guys that aren't big price free agents, some guys that can come in and, and fill a role because I think he's two years away from kind of get the total rebuild of what he wants or maybe what he envisions, that it's going to take two more years, but you still have to fill those gaps in between with some of the guys that he tried to fill this year, but you've got to hit on the, the high draft picks and these top price free agents. Do you think he hit on the coaching staff or are you a Matt Eberflus fan? I am. Um, I don't want to get into maybe some of the positions where I think there might be some changes. I think a lot of times when a new head coach comes in, he's kind of strapped for who he can pick for different positions. You know, I'm sure he's got his offensive coordinator. I like, I like Luke Getze and I like Alan Williams, but I think there's some other position coaches that maybe that are some of his buddies. A lot of the way that this league works, you bring your buddies in and then you can only find some guys your first year that have just been recently fired that maybe you can find an upgrade. So I have a feeling that just the way tradition of the NFL has gone, the coaching staff, so you're going to see some changes. But I think the guys – his top lieutenants, his top coordinators are the guys that are they're going to stick for a little while until maybe they get a head coaching job that people are talking about. Right, let me rewind back here now. Uh, favorite coach that you played for in a Bears uniform? 16 years. Oh, head coach or just total coach? Head coach. Uh, Lovey Smith. Lovey now, Smith was a le leader of men. I just I loved every day going into Alice Hall. Just a great coach. Great man. Okay, so and I asked, I've asked a lot of your teammates this because, you know, on our side of it, he was exhausting. And, yes, uh, I understand. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but there's something about him that you all loved. So how do you yes. define it or explain it? The consistency. So you're walking into your offices there. You know what you're going to get every day. If you go into any corporation, you hopefully you know what you're going to get every day. There's not these highs, lows, crazy yes, crazy no, crazy screaming, crazy yes. It was very consistent every day, and our expectations and standard he set was very high. And I describe him as like a heartbeat, like, you know, the heartbeat gets up and down, da -da -da -da, whatever. His little tick, either up or down, if it just went up a little bit, you're like, oh, my gosh, I got Lovey Smith to get a little tick. He's excited about me. Or if it went down, 
you felt terrible. Like you just felt horrible, horrible about it. I'll give you a quick example. I got a personal foul against Green Bay. I kicked the guy in the knee. He should never have done that. He called over the sideline. He just looked at me. Didn't have to say a word. Never called me to the office. A 15-yard penalty. He hurt us pretty bad in the game. Never had to say a word to me. And I felt like I let my dad down, like even more than my dad. But that's kind of the respect we had for him and the way he treated us as adults, men, or whatever in that building. But we loved going to Hallis Hall every day. We loved going to work. He allowed us to have fun. But also when it was time to be serious, we were very serious. When did you know that Mark Tressman was not going to work out? Mm. <laughs> I guess I've been a little vocal about him on the score back when I first retired. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it was pretty soon. Well, I'll tell you this. It was, it was actually during training camp. We had Kyle Long was our first round draft pick. Jody Camillus was the uh, special teams coach. I had a lot of respect for him. My first year working for him. Couldn't wait to work for him. He's an old school coach. He's going to yell. He's fiery. He's going to get in your face. He's going to be honest and call you out. And I like that. Kyle Long and kickoff drill, they have him back in like the back wedge, blocks the wrong guy like three plays in a row. And it's like, Kyle, we're going to run it again for you. Kyle, we're going to run it again for you. Third time he blocks the wrong guy or does something. Joe D. Camillus goes crazy. And this is down there in Bourbon A on those fields, starts cussing. And, you know, some coaches now don't want you to cuss and do all that stuff and gets in his face. He's like, you know, yelling at Kyle. And Kyle knows how to take it. You know, his dad is and his brother is. Mark Tressman comes running down and just, just goes after Jody Camillus in front of everybody. And I'm like, you just lost me as a special teams captain or player or whatever. You just yelled at my coach and undressed him in front of the entire team. That should have been something done off the field in meetings, but it was done in, in, in out in front of us. I didn't like that. And I'm like, wait a minute. He just, who's in control here? What's going on? I just, I did not like that. And from then on, honestly, just, I'd been around, was I 38, 39 years old at the time? I'd been around a while. I kind of kept snooping and just kind of looking around and seeing how things are working. And I'm like, I just don't know if this guy has it. With this locker room we had, one, and then with the coaching staff he had put together. Well, didn't he come in there and, like, move everybody around? I, I uh, Yeah, remember. he did. I didn't like that either. <laughs> yeah. I'd been in my same – luckily, the veterans, we didn't have to move. They moved some other guys around us. But also, I didn't like it, and I talked to some other guys about it. So, real quick, if people don't know, they moved – they took our um, – our locker room was – Linebackers together, O-line together, quarterback, you know, position groups are all together. I think that's a great way to do it because when you come out of meetings, you have a limited 15 minutes, you got to get taped, whatever, get ready for practice. I just knew on the O-line side, like Olin, Garza, those guys, Ruben Brown, they would continue the meeting while they're getting dressed. So they're still talking about what we went over, about looks we're going to see in practice. Well, then if I have John Bostic and whoever, I forgot what the other guy next to my left was, I couldn't talk about what we just came out of meetings with. Granted, I'm a long snapper, but I'm talking about positional guys. And I thought that took an extra 15 minutes of guys being able to talk. He thought it was more valuable that you're going to get to know who John Bostic is or oh, Jordan Mills, where he's from. And I get all that, but I, I, just, I just didn't like that either. I just It didn't work for our team. We were too much of a veteran team at that time and wasn't a fan of it. Yeah, I, not to call anybody out. It's not even a call out. Or, uh, but Earl Bennett told me like what, what he did with the wide receivers. Like He's like, people were just like, what, 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 what are you doing? Like, these dudes... This, these are our guys. We hang out. We do. We talk yes. football. I mean, come on. Well, well, you're continuing the meetings. You're continuing talking football. He yeah. wanted it more life. And all I'm like, I get that all the kumbaya stuff, but not <laughs> not right now. We can do that after practice. We can do that, you know, in the weight room or not even the weight room. You can do that just somewhere else. You can do it on Thursday night at dinner with the team or something. I don't know. I I, I wasn't a big fan of it. Yeah, you know, I, I get it. Uh, okay. I always liked Kyle Orton, Patrick. Uh, oh. So so. If he's the QB in 2006, what's the chance you win the Super Bowl? Oh, man, that's tough. I was just texting with Rex Grossman today. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no, and it's no weird offense. I was. And no, it's weird I was. No, it's no offense. I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I think Kyle brought the team closer together. That's he was a, it's a bad thing to say, a better teammate. Rex is a good guy, and a good guy but everybody rallied around Kyle Orton. But could Kyle have done what Rex did, what, the first 11, 12 games? I mean, he was in the MVP conversation of what his numbers were. If you go back and look, what were we, 11-0 yeah. or 10-0? and um, Could we have done that? I don't know. Um, so he helped us set up our success. Man, Mark, this is a hard question. Um, two good friends, but could – all right, let's put it this way. Would Super Bowl Sunday have turned out differently? Probably. I think it probably would. Really, you wouldn't have had the same turnovers. I don't think you would have had – I don't think Kyle would have turned the ball over as many times as Rex did on Super Bowl Sunday. 
How's that answer for you? I, I love that answer, and uh, I <laughs> is it politically I correct enough and whatever? <laughs> no, no, I don't think I, both I, guys. I think we just yeah. made. I think we just got a little bit of a good clip there, to be honest. And I would also throw in: uh, Did you think? Because all of Chicago didn't think it. I was like the one guy raised my hand, like, "Hey, second, I like Kyle Orton. We don't need to be trading into Denver for Cutler." Like, I was on the, I was on the Orton trade. And everyone was screaming at me at the time. Like, I'm like, "Dude, this guy is solid. Not spectacular, yes. but solid." Yes. Did you think at the time that that, that might have been a mistake? Um, I got a little caught up in the, and Kyle's one of my best friends, um, and I got caught up a little bit in the Jay Cutler hype as well. I mean, you saw what he had done in. In Denver, you saw some of the numbers. You saw his arm. You knew he's a little bit more of a veteran. We were becoming a more of a veteran team. Um, and when he got to Hallis Hall in our first couple of practices, I remember standing next to Dave Tobe, our special teams coach, and Jay made some throws, and we just said, holy, wow, we don't see that around here ever. Um, but there's some other intangibles with Jay that just didn't work out and didn't reach the potential I think we all were wanting. Um but if you look back on it, Kyle might have fit that locker room better just because of who he was and how dominant our defense was and how he would take care of the ball and we can still run the ball and you know, the game's changed now. But back then, that, that might have been a better fit. But I understand what Jerry Angelo did. He was the new shiny toy, had the big arm, kind of youngish, but had a couple of years and needed to get out of there. And it is what it is. But um, too many quarterbacks I play with, Mark. Yeah, I, be quarterbacks. I, I mean, seriously, I went through it. It's <laughs> hold on. I wanted to get to, to, uh, a lot. Z -Reti I feel Z -Reti bad for Olin Cruz. I feel bad for him and how many people he had to snap to. This is it, ridiculous. The, the, I went through it here. Uh, you come in your six and 10. Uh, I'm sorry. You come in your four and 12. There, there were six people that threw a pass that year. I have, I give you a 1% oh, yeah. chance that you can name all six. Oh boy. Three okay. Were Eric, Eric Kramer. You're Correct. talking 98, 98, Steve Stimstrom. Yep. Yep, yep, that's two. Moses, yep. Moses Moreno. That's three. Oh, man, why am I this? Uh, two or two, we got a running back, uh, oh, wide receiver. Oh, okay. and, so I got the three starting quarterbacks then. Yes. Um, I'll get, did Curtis Conway throw a pass? He did. Okay. That's excellent. So how many more do I need? Two. Two more? Oh, you said well, six. That's right. Uh, James was Allen? A, no, James Allen did not throw a pass. No. Did he? No. Running back. Or Edgar Bennett. Correct. Oh my and goodness. honestly, I, I wrote this name down, and I don't even know who he is. Mike Horan. That's correct. Wow, great job. Fantastic. <laughs> and then for I just I, want it, to... it, that, that, that is, we, we got it. We'll send you a CHGO sweatshirt something. For I that. will that was take that. Yeah. That is a uh, good question. I, I'm surprised they got it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, and then so you Mike, Mike Horan was our punter. Okay, there we go. Okay. Yeah, there we called him Kickstand Horan. <laughs> he was like 40 years old i was like he's gonna remember he's definitely gonna know my Quran because of your job and all that <laughs> yes. so yeah uh shane matthews Cade mcdown jim miller it took yeah it took forever to figure out that jim miller could play because the next year mccown got the mm -hmm. most starts followed by matthews and then miller and then finally you get to 30 to 3 miller's playing with matthews and then it turns into miller chandler burris cordell stewart chandler grossman and on and on and on Grossman, Quinn, Krenzel, Hutchinson. Hutchinson. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's, by the way, it's not a disrespect to any of those dudes. No, but it's laughable that you have that many people, that many injuries, and just guys couldn't stick. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's a, it's a tough position, tough life, all that. But mm -hmm. you do you think that 06, you win the Super Bowl with Fields? I'm assuming yes. Oh, with Fields, yes. And I also think we win it with Tommy Harris and Mike Brown if they're playing. That's another one I was going to ask you. The the best defensive player that you ever were on on a team with? Oh, it's Erlacher number one for sure. First ballot Hall of okay. Famer. It deserves every bit okay. of that. But um, how about two? I mean, number two. Um, Julius Peppers is the m most dynamic athlete, the most impressive athlete I've ever seen on a field. Yeah. Brian was amazing, but Ju Julius being what six foot seven, six foot eight, being as athletic as he was. I just, you know, just being able to tip a ball up and catch it like a, like a wide receiver, things like that were just amazing. But overall, defensive player, Brian Urlacher for sure. Um, but him and Julius are, are up there neck and neck as the most impressive athletes I think I've seen on the defensive side of the ball. I love hearing you guys talk about Julius Pepper and the Peppers and the freak mm -hmm. athlete that he was. Hey, uh, Patrick, this has been awesome. I hope to do it mm -hmm. again with you here. But uh, let's talk about your award. Yeah. Working with Zebra Technologies. 
the which is just amazing. You went to Duke, of course. We're talking about the best college long snappers, the underappreciated out there. We got three finalists this year. Uh, Matt Hembro, Oklahoma State. Chris Stoll, Penn State. Alex Ward, UCF. Just uh, talk about, first of all, just having an, an award named after <laughs> you and, and the candidates and, and working with Zebra. Well, we'll start with, I'm humbled to say it's the Manly Award. I, I have a hard time. On, like, we have the award Saturday night, and we'll get into that maybe in a second. I call it the Long Snapper Award because I just don't like calling it the Manly Award. Um, but Kevin Gold and Chris Rubio are the true kind of real founders of this award. I think it's like 99%. It might be 100% now of all Division One college schools. Long Snappers get a scholarship. So they deserve an award just as a punter does, just as a kicker does, just as a center does, just the quarterback. In my opinion, they do. They're treated that way. When colleges go recruit players, they are a full roster spot. They are now in the NFL. Thank God that I lucked out too in the timing of that. Um, but now it's called the Manly Award. So we want to be on stage with everybody else and recognize the top college long snapper. We're in our fourth year of doing this. Um, me, Kevin, and Chris have been able to have a really successful first four years because of Bernie's Book Bank, who was, who was the beneficiary. It's uh, up in Lake Bluff, who uh, serves underprivileged kids with, with books, underserves kids with books. We'll give them a, a bag of books that, you know, most of these kids don't have kids, books in their house. And it's amazing to go on these book distributions. We'll do that with the three finalists. And then also it couldn't be done without Zebra Technologies is kind of the money behind it. But what's cool is Zebra Technologies is, is you know, all the next gen, next gen stats. They're the ones with all the chips and the pads, the helmets, the balls, all that kind of stuff to put that together. So it's been a neat kind of marriage to work with them as a long snapper as well, and to help them kind of break down how their technology can help us better as long snappers. But it's been great for them to help us with Bernie book, Bernie's book bank and then also find out who the nation's top college long snapper is. Love it. Uh, appreciate the time. Last one on the oh, way out. They get the number two overall draft pick. What are you doing with it? Trading. Trading down. I, I, I just think they're, I think they're in need of so many positions that you can trade down. But then if you look at what Will Anderson and then Carter from Georgia, do you take them at two? I haven't looked at them enough, and I'm sure they, they're still looking at them. And they got some big games coming up with the college um, college you know playoff system. They, they're going to watch them you know play against high-caliber teams. They're going to evaluate them more. But uh, I'm going to trade down. I just think you need to – there's too many pieces right now you got to add to. It, it's, a, it's a fair take. Your guy Josh Blackwell, by the way, the Duke, he's playing well. I'd, yes, like, to see him get, I'd like to see him get more of an opportunity. I like him. Great stuff, so. Patrick. Appreciate you. You bet. See you, Mark. Have a good one. Take care.